miss everybody that's not here tonight. Are we on Facebook yet? Hello, Facebook friends. We're glad you're joining with us tonight. We appreciate you joining in as we come on this midweek refueling service station, if you will. This is a refueling station, and I'm glad that you're here. Those of you that couldn't be here in person, hopefully you've joined us on Facebook, and we really appreciate all of you. Brother Ron Moles, we're praying for you and believing God to work a miracle in your heart, and God's going to work a great, great miracle. We're expecting that. We've had many, many good reports this week, and we're thanking God for all of those good reports and good things that God is doing. For those of you that are moving uh, houses, I know that's a stressful time, so Addie and Donnie, we pray for you and believe God to touch you and help you as you go through this season in your life, and I know that He will do that. So if you've been following along with us, we've been walking through the book of Revelation. This is chapter number 14 that we're looking at tonight. This is lesson number 23. Lesson number 23 in chapter 14 of the book of Revelation. We've been breaking it down to the best of our ability. Last week, we really got into some deep stuff in chapter 13. It's really deep, really technical stuff, really uh, have to do a lot of studying, a lot of looking, a lot of researching. There's a lot of disagreements on some of the uh, scholars and some of the output, of the way people look at it. Tonight, in lesson number 23, chapter 14, we're going to be looking at future scenes of heaven and earth. What's the future scenes going to look like in heaven and earth? And I don't know, I hope that you enjoyed those last two songs. Those were on purpose, they weren't haphazard, they were on purpose. And I noticed that sometimes, and I know we get tired in these physical bodies, I understand that. Sometimes I get thinking, are they, are they ever going to get done with the singing on, on Sunday mornings? And it seems like, you know, I, I, I want it to go on, I want it to go on, but I'm sitting over here like a bulldog ready to go with a message, and I'm thinking, uh, let, let's quit, let's, let's change gear. But you know what we're going to be doing through all eternity? Does anybody know what we're going to be doing? We're going to be worshiping the Lord. The Bible says that those that are in His presence right now are crying, Holy, Holy, Holy. It's continuous. It never stops. There's going to be one time when there's silence in heaven. Does anybody know when that is? Somebody said that that, uh, that just proves that the men get raptured 30 minutes before the women get to heaven. Just kidding. I know the Lord's got a sense of humor, but that is when there's all kinds of turmoil happening here. Don't know exactly the time frame, but it's during the Great Tribulation period, and there will be silence in heaven because of the woe and the grief that's going on here on planet Earth. But uh, other than that, it's going to be holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. We get to worship Him throughout all eternity. So let's get into this chapter, but just, just before we do that, I want to ask you guys if you'll put your hand on your heart, and I'm going to, hopefully you got a heart tonight, those of you that are watching by Facebook, if you'll just take a break, put your hand on your heart, let's ask the Lord to help us to receive what He has tonight. You know, the Bible teaches that the words are sown but they're sown many times in different locations, and they fall on different types of soil. If you'll read the Scriptures, uh, you'll find that some seed fall on rocky ground, stony ground. Some seed fall on, by the wayside, different places. That's why it's important for us to have our hearts prepared. That's why it's important for us to have worship before we get into the message. It's important to prepare our hearts. So, Father, tonight... We ask you to prepare our hearts. We ask you, Lord, to help us to prepare ourselves that we might receive what the Word says, what you say to us as individuals. God, help us tonight to realize that, yes, if we're looking for you, if we're ready for you, 
We're going to miss most of this that we're talking about tonight. It's something we're not going to have to endure. But God, I'm asking you to help us to pull the nuggets out and, and to pull the things out that are so important for us to pass along to our friends that may not be ready to meet you, to those of our community that need to know that there's a loving Savior and there's a dispensation of grace and that dispensation is coming fast to a close. I'm asking you... Help us, Father, as individuals here tonight. You knew how many would be here. You know every person. You know our footsteps. And you said they were ordered by you. So I'm asking you, Lord, to help us to take these words in that we can use and that we'll need in time to come. Help us, Father. Lord, we pray for Jerusalem tonight. We pray for Israel. God, we pray for your wonderful hand to reach out and touch Israel. And we know that there's much more than the iron dome that's covering Israel tonight. We know, God, that your word says that you never slumber nor sleep, but you watch over Israel 24-7. I pray that you'll keep them, Lord. Lord, let the casualties be minimal. God, give people uh, real uh, bright ideas and real, uh, Lord, spiritual insight to see through this situation and to bring it to a quick close. We love you and we pray for your blessed people, in Jesus' name. And the church said, So this chapter tonight answers two questions raised in the two previous chapters. Number one, what happens to those who refuse to receive the mark of the beast and are killed? And then what happens to the beast and his false prophets and his followers? So let's jump right into chapter 14. I'm going to start by reading verses 1 through 5, and then we're going to break it up, chapter 14, into three sections as the Lord helps us to expound on this and try to unwrap this package that has been written to us so many years ago. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads, and I Heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of a loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang as it were a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. Verse 4, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. So the first point that we want to look at here is... Just a minute, let me see. Oh, I didn't read it all. Verse 5, okay. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they were without fault before the throne of God. I broke pace there. Let me go back, read verse 4 and 5 again together because they go really close together. There are, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit. For they are without fault before the throne of God. Let's look tonight at number one, the lamb and the 144,000. So John looks and he sees an amazing sight here on Mount Zion, which is the one in heaven, just like the one that's listed in Hebrews. And I'm going to read that just in a minute for your clarity so that you'll know even though John is seeing a vision here, and many times this vision is transferring from heaven to earth and from earth to heaven. He's been seeing things on earth, but here in chapter 14 he begins to see the original Mount Zion. There is a Mount Zion in Israel on planet earth. I've stood there. Teresa and I were there uh, many years ago, and we got to enjoy the presence of the Lord there on Mount Zion and enjoy the things as we remembered what was recounted in the Scriptures, and we thought about 
what happened there on Mount Zion and how that Jesus went back into heaven there and one thing after another that happened recorded in the book about Mount Zion. But how many of you know that many things that are patterned on earth are patterned after the original blueprint of heaven? So there is a Mount Zion in heaven and that's where that John is seeing this future scene that, that, that's happening here and as he, sees, as he sees these scenes yet at the future or at the end of the great tribulation when Christ returns in judgment and as he starts here with the lamb and the 144,000 John looks and sees this amazing sight and it's the same as recorded in Hebrews 12 and 22 if you're writing down notes but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly, notice that word right there, did you see it? The heavenly, the heavenly Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. That's what I belong to. You say, Brother Dale, you're a member of the church of God. I am, but I'm a member of the first assembly of the firstborn. Hallelujah. I'm a part of the assembly of those that are born of God who are registered in heaven. That means their names are written down in the Lamb's book of life. To God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So a lot of that stuff there didn't pertain to what we were talking about, but I needed to read it all to make sure that you understood what's being addressed here. It is the Mount Zion that's in heaven. So there stand the Lamb there on Mount Zion in heaven. Now again, let me reiterate, John is seeing on down the road to the end of the, of the tribulation period. On down the road to the end. There stand the 144,000 who have his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. These 144,000 are the same group that we also talked about in chapter number 7. You remember them. Everybody remembers the 144,000. We said that these 144,000 would be Jewish men that were born, that were young men that come on board of Christianity just after the rapture of the church. We believe that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ goes to heaven and then we believe that 144,000 Jewish men get saved the same way you and I get saved. We believe that they believe on the blood of Jesus Christ, the salvation of mankind, the penalty, the sacrifice that was paid. They believe in Christ and the Father stamps them on the forehead and they are branded and can't be touched as they go across this earth during the tribulation and they witness or they testify of the Lord Jesus Christ. They share the good news. This is the 144,000 that we're talking about. So the name or the seal that's on their forehead protected them from the wrath of the dragon, Satan, and the beast. Now remember, this 144,000, we believe, gets raptured about mid-part, maybe just a hair after mid-part of the tribulation period. Since they are in heaven, their work on earth is finished. Is that simple enough? Can we surmise that John is seeing them in heaven? It's at the end of the tribulation period. Their work is done, and so they're in heaven. They're singing a song that no one can learn except the 144,000 redeemed from the earth, and it could well be Psalm 149. Do any of you all know the Psalm 149? Let me look it up here right quick for you, and let's... I want to read that. Has anybody got a Bible that can pull it up pretty quick? I'm trying to see, and this light is kind of... You got it? Psalm 149, read it. Come up here. You know, never mind. Give her a microphone there, if you will, so she can read it out loud. I want everybody to be able to hear it. Psalm 149. His faithful people. Let Israel rejoice in their Maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their King. Let them praise His name with dancing and make music to Him with timbrel and harp. 
For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. Let his faithful people rejoice in this honor and sing for joy on their beds. May the praise of God be in their mouths and double a double-edged sword in their hands to inflict vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with fetters, their nobles with shackles of iron, to carry out the sentence written against them. This is the glory of all his faithful people. Praise the Lord. Thank you. We feel like that that may be the song that they're going to sing, or at least parts of it, because it's talked about there how that they will, you know, the Bible says that, that during the thousand-year reign, the... the uh, the, the people will rule as Christ rules with a rod of iron. And it mentioned that in there. So we feel like that that's part of it. But these 144,000 are further described as not defiling themselves with women, for they are virgins. And what this is really saying, if you study it out in the original Hebrew, it's saying that they are virgins because they did not corrupt themselves with this idolatrous system. They didn't corrupt themselves with this system. Faith in anything other than Christ and the cross constitutes spiritual adultery, which is idolatry. So the 144,000 follow the Lamb wherever He goes, according to verse number 4. And this indicates that they followed Jesus exclusively, no matter how difficult that it got. So after salvation... After they were saved at the beginning of the tribulation period, they didn't look at anything else. They didn't do anything else. They just preached the Word of God and followed the directions of the Lord wherever. Also, these have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. In the Old Testament, first fruits are the first and the best part of a harvest and are offered to God. Now, that is where... A lot of us get our thoughts and our theology. There's more scriptures that bring you up to this, but when we talk about giving our first of our income to the Lord, our first fruits to the Lord. My mother, I, I never will forget it, she a few years ago was, was doing a garden, and uh, it was right after we started uh, ministering, and, and mom started getting tomatoes and stuff out of her garden, and she came with a, with a basket or a bag to us, and she said, these are my first tomatoes, and I'm supposed to give them to you. <laughs> and so I thought that was sweet, but what it's saying is, and this is where a lot of this comes from, if Christ doesn't deserve the first parts of us, where are our hearts? And I know I didn't use good grammar right there, but it's about the best way that I know how to put it out. And I was trying to preach on that Sunday, and I felt like I didn't get everything out that I needed to get put out. But if you're coming to church because you feel like it's a necessity and you have to, and you're doing it to please anybody other than the Lord Jesus Christ, there's a heart problem. We've got a heart problem. There's something going on in our heart. If we're not in love with Jesus Christ, and we're trying to meet some kind of a quota or some kind of works to get the job done. Can I tell you tonight, works won't work. We've got to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and He must be first. You know, there was tags that come out many years ago. Some of you all probably remember them. The Lord or Jesus is my co-pilot. You remember those uh, automobile tags that people put on their vehicles? Listen, if He's your co-pilot, there's a problem with your heart because if He's not driving, if He's not in the lead, if He's not in the top, if He's not the cream of the crop of your life, if He's not first place, then we've got a serious issue that we need to deal with. And I'm thinking... In my mind and in what I'm seeing in a lot of situations, in a lot of churches, that is a lot of problem in churches today. Our church, our people, good Christian people, especially since COVID, have gotten so mixed up with worldly things. I'm not sure where Jesus is coming in at. But I'm praying and I'm believing and it's God's will that we all be refreshed and revived and renewed and restored. Can I hear an amen? Okay, so in the Old Testament, it's talking about these first fruits. Then the Greek word translated first fruit, that's aparche, that's the Greek word aparche, and it's found several times in the New Testament, and it pictures faithful believers who are 
the first to be converted, the first ones. So remember it said, first fruits to God, right? You remember that? So these first fruits are people that are saved first out of revelation, out of the, out of the uh, tribulation period, the first fruits that are be given to God and victorious over death. The 144,000 are a choice. I'm going to slow down just a little bit so we can eat on this. The 144,000 are a choice offering to God, representing the best in the world during the tribulation period. That is the 144,000, the select men that have shared the gospel. Remember back, I believe it's back in, the, in the, the gospel of Matthew or Mark. I forget exactly where it is, but it talks about how can they receive unless there be a preacher. You remember those words? If you go on and you read the next verse on down just below that, it says, Beautiful are the feet of those that share the gospel. I've always uh, told Teresa it's kind of a little joke that my feet's pretty because the Bible says that they are. But at any rate, the Bible is talking about here these people that are coming out of the great tribulation, these are the cream of the crop and they are the first fruits unto God as an offering unto God. By use of the word first fruits, this tells us that the entire nation of Israel is coming to Christ. What do you think about that? A lot of people are, are not on board with that, but that's what the Word of God says. If you think about the first fruits, if you think about the first fruits, what about the fruits after that? If it's a first fruit, there has to be second, third, and fourth fruits, right? So the nation of Israel, I believe, during the tribulation period... At the end of the tribulation, the whole nation of Israel will turn back to Jesus, back to the Lord, and they'll realize that they messed up royally, that they crucified the Savior, but all of it was in God's master plan. It all had to happen. But they're all going to turn their hearts over to the Lord. And that's the way we're going to start into the millennial, into the thousand-year reign with the Jewish people, and Christ is going to be uh, residing and reigning from Jerusalem there at the original uh, site of David's throne. So after describing, that was point number one, the Lamb and the 144,000, John then, in, in uh, point number two, he describes the message of these first three angels. Now this gets pretty deep, but we're going to try to stay as shallow as we can so we can understand what we're talking about. And I'm going to be reading verses 6 through verse 13, still in chapter 14. That's where we'll be all night. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. Can you imagine that? Here we are, and I've got to expound on this just a little bit while the Spirit's got this thought in my brain before I lose it. But here we are, according to Scriptures, almost to the end of the Great Tribulation. We've had earthquakes. We've had fire fall out of heaven in the form of, of meteors. We've had all kinds of horrendous earthquakes and things that have shook the earth. And many, many people have perished. But God is still showing forth mercy and he's sending an angel to all of these people that are still on planet earth and giving them another opportunity this angel is that's the first time in scripture that we have recorded where an angel preaches the gospel the first time you can tell somebody write that down in your little notebook i know when the first time an angel preached the gospel now i'm not talking about an angel bringing good news to a woman that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an angel preaching the gospel message. What is the gospel message? Somebody tell me. Jesus Christ, alive forevermore, paid for our sin, died. You don't have to do because he did. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God! And give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water, and other 
And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, here is a dire threat. This is what's going to happen to anybody that worships the beast. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works. Follow them. So, let's look now at this section of Scripture. Section from 6, verse 6 through Verse 13, John sees an angel flying overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to everyone that's left on planet earth. Now listen to me, this is the same gospel of grace that was preached by Paul and the apostles. The same gospel, there's no other gospel, there's just one gospel, there's one way to get to heaven, one way to entertain and to enjoy the mercy of God, and this angel is preaching that gospel as he flies across planet earth. The message of the angel is the eternal gospel as a reminder of the never-changing gospel that has been proclaimed since the time of Christ. The angel says with a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory. The angel is calling on people to not give allegiance to the beast and worship the Lamb. Even as God's final judgment nears, He will give people the opportunity once again to repent. And if you want a study reference on that, if you can write it down, it's 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 9. I'm not for sake of time going back there. However, time is running out because the bowls of wrath, B-O-W-L-S, the bowls of wrath will soon be poured out on the unbelieving world. We'll find that out in Revelations chapter 15 and chapter 16, when those bowls of wrath began to be poured out. Verse 8 through verse 14 are like a table of context or contents for the remainder of the book of Revelation. John sees then another angel following the first, and he's shouting, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immortality. Or immorality, I'm sorry. This is called a proleptic, a proleptic message, and it anticipates the event before it happens, though expressing it in past tense terms. Does that make any sense to you? It's a prophetic message, but it's looking at something and describing it as in past tense. I know it's kind of confusing. It's called P R O L E P T I C, proleptic. It's a proleptic message. It anticipates the event. It sees the event before it happens, but it speaks in a past tense as if it was already or it's expressed in a past tense. So Babylon is the one being addressed here. Will be rebuilt, it says. She will fall at the conclusion of the Great Tribulation. Now, does anybody has anyone ever studied about Babylon the Great? You, anybody ever studied about that big city of Babylon? It was a wicked, wicked city. It was, a, it was a, a, a horrendous place at one time. As Babylon was the site of the earth's first organized rebellion against God, Babylon was the site of the first city 
that rebelled against God. The first rebellion happened there in Babylon. You can find it in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 9, if you want to turn there. Then as it was the first, it will as well be the site of the last great organized rebellion. A third angel follows the second, shouting, If anyone worships the beast in its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will drink of the wine of God's wrath. And we know that that is the last torments. Therefore, the ultimate destiny of those who receive the mark of the beast will be with the beast for all eternity. Can you imagine that? I heard somebody say something, I think it was on a Facebook post here a while back, and it was like uh, some Christian was sharing a post from a sinner person, and sinners are going to be sinners, right? They're going to do the things that sinners do. But this sinner spoke up and said, I'm looking forward to hell where I can be with par- in a party all the time with people just like me. How deceived and how fierce an anger, a wrath is coming upon people like that. It's so sad. I pray that that person gets delivered before anything like that happens. So the ultimate destiny of those who, dece- who receive the mark will be with the beast forever. In New Testament times, people added three parts of water to one part wine to, to, to dilute it. Did you know that? When the, the Bible's talking about wine, it's basically talking about a drink. And it's very hard to get intoxicated on the wine of the day back then. It was three parts water, one part wine. However, God will pour out His wrath, He said, at full strength. There's not going to be any mixing, not going to be any mingling with water. And God is stressing the severity of His judgment. If you know Him... You don't have to go through this. If you know Him, you trust in Him, you have faith in Him, it's something you don't have to worry about. Therefore, the third angel announces, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest, day or night. These worshipers of the beast and its image, whoever receives the mark of its name. The trail of ascending smoke is an eternal reminder of the doom of the beast and his worshipers. Following the promise of God's coming wrath, John has words of encouragement to believers who must go through the great tribulation period. He writes, Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus Christ. That's verse number 12 that we just read a few minutes ago. I want to read it again. We need to hear this. I pray that none of you are here for the great tribulation period. But listen to me. If there's somebody here tonight and you don't know for sure, or maybe you're listening on Facebook, you don't know for sure that you're going to be with the Lord when the trumpet sounds. The Bible says that He's coming. The rapture of the church is going to be for those who are looking for Him. As these things transpire and unfold before us that's happening right now in Israel, if there's ever been a day that we need to open our eyes and realize the coming of the Lord could be instantaneously. He may come before we finish with this tonight. He may come before you get up in the morning. It's important before you lay your head down on your bed of a night, it's important for you to have a clear spirit. You say, Brother Dale, I accepted Jesus a long time ago. He forgave me of all my sins, past, present, and future. And there's a large group of followers that are following that teaching. He forgave my sins, past, present, and future. And that is very true if you stay in Christ. I can prove it to you through the Word of God. It's not something that's confusing. It's provable through God's Word. If we stay in Him, we're going to be watching for Him. If we stay in Him, we're going to try our best to stay away from this world and the clutches of this world. I went to a meeting this morning where the district attorney talked to us about the evil that's encroaching upon our city, upon our county. It's important for us that are Bible-believing, really folk who love the Lord, not faking it, 
not just trying to get by, not just trying to make it another day. It's important for us to stand up and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The time of getting by and just making it through is over. The time of being a silent Christian and nobody knowing that you're a Christian is pretty much gone out the window. You're going to have to stand up if you're going to be a Christian and say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and we're going to live a Christian life. We're going to do our very best for the Lord and we're going to do everything that we can to get our family members and those that are around us saved and ready to go. So, if any of you miss the rapture, if any of you that are listening by Facebook, God forbid, but if it happens and you miss the rapture, please, whatever you do, develop a relationship with God in the first part of the tribulation. At the beginning of the tribulation, there's going to be a peace time in the Mideast. All of this mess that's going on right now, I believe, is going to culminate right before the rapture takes place. That's my thoughts. This could be the, this could be the battle that's going on right now that gets us out of here. It might not be. I'm not a date setter. The Bible says no man knows the day nor the hour that the Son of Man comes back. But I can tell you this, we can know the seasons. Jesus says, as you see the budding on the tree, you know that summer is nigh. He said, that's the way you look and see. The seasons, the signs are right. It's never been as right and ripe as it is right now. People are dying and they're saying, I heard Benjamin Netanyahu not very long ago, the prime minister of Israel. He's working toward peace. He's trying his best. I heard him, uh, uh, I heard him give a speech to the United Nations. He's trying his best to get Saudi Arabia and some of the joining co- uh, c- uh, countries to, to befriend Israel. And when he tries to get peace like that, we see this group of hellish people that are against Israel, that want to annihilate Israel. Now, don't, don't, don't misunderstand. There's good Palestinian people. Not all of Palestine are, are people that are connected to Hamas. That just happens to be where Hamas is right now, in the Palestinian city, in the Gaza Strip, and up through that area right there. And, and it's a mess, and it could lead up to what we're talking about right here. At any rate... It's a forerunner of where it's going. All the carnage and all the stuff that you're hearing about and that you're seeing. Can you imagine these soldiers that came into Israel? They said there was about a thousand of them. They bulldozed the fence down. They came in. My theory about how that happened is because Israel has been in her own turmoil here for about uh, three, four months. It's been going on internally. They've been trying to uh, get Netanyahu to, to sit down and shut up and put somebody else in. They've got all kinds of internal turmoil going on. And you know what happens when a house divided against itself? You know what happens? The Bible says it can't stand. So the division from inside kept them from looking at the enemy on the outside. Is, is my opinion of it, and for whatever my opinion's worth, everybody's got some of them, but uh, that's my opinion, and so these, these soldiers, a thousand of them, came in, uh, is what I'm told, from Gaza Strip side in the southern part of Israel there, and as they were going, and I'm going somewhere to tie this in here, is why I'm stopping here right now with this, but as they were going house to house, and it showed on TV one excerpt, and it's usually they don't show this kind of stuff. They, they, they said that it was not good for small viewers, but there was a person that was hiding behind a car, and one of these guys slipped up behind them and shot them point-blank range in the back of the head from, from the back. And, 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 and dragging people out, they're beheading Israeli sh- soldiers. How can that happen? It's demonic possession and can you imagine when the church leaves planet earth can you imagine when the, all of the churches that are praying for the society and for the people and for the country when the churches all leave can you imagine what scale of demonic carnage is going to happen can you imagine what the antichrist army is going to look like it's going to be filled with these kind of people the hamas 
the Ayatollah uh, uh, Khomeini's, uh, those kind of people, and I'm not, I'm not trying to select a group of people. I'm saying this is the spirit that's going to be reigning during the Antichrist. That's the spirit that's going to be here. You don't want to be here. You, you, you want to get out of here. You want to get out of here. So we know that those commandments can't possibly be kept. What commandments? The commandments that he's talking about. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus Christ. I was saying a minute ago, if you, by some chance, those of you listening by Facebook, if any of you don't make it in the rapture, here's an encouragement from John the Revelator. And he says, endure, endure whatever you have to do. If they don't give you food, endure. Don't take the mark of the beast because if you do, you have damned your soul. That means it's over. There's no help for you, no longer any possibility of being saved and spending eternity with Jesus. So we know that there's no way of of keeping the commandments of God aside from putting our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So what I'm saying If somebody's left here, put all of your faith in Jesus, every bit of it. Don't put any faith in yourself. Don't put any faith in your government. Don't put any faith in your friends. Put all of your faith in Jesus Christ and take His Word and live by the Word every day. Pray continually and expect that you'll lose your life. Most likely, you'll lose your life. But it's better for that than to lose your eternal soul The message is that it's far better to experience the beast's temporary punishment, even martyrdom, than God's eternal wrath. Next, John hears a voice from heaven say, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Then the Spirit says that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. This doesn't mean that we will be in a big, restful, easy chair throughout eternity. That's not saying that we're going to float around on a cloud up in heaven and uh, eat, uh, what is that, uh, cream cheese. Uh, They had a commercial on TV floating on a a cloud eating cream cheese. That's not what it's talking about. But it says that they're going to be able to rest from the persecution and suffering. That's what this has just been describing in this chapter 14 that we've just been talking about. This persecution, this suffering, they're now home. It's done. They don't have to worry about it anymore, and they can rest from that. The word deeds refer to their service to the Lord. In heaven, God will reward us for everything that we ever done in service to Him. Now, if you're a note taker and you want to look that up, Mark chapter 9, verse 41, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10 are two good scriptures. I can give you a bunch more, but that's two good ones to get started with. How many of you know that from the time you got saved until the time you die or the time you go in the rapture, we're going to face our works. Our works, we're going to be judged for those works. You could be the best person in the world and doing your works for the wrong reason and not have anything except get into heaven. And some of you might say, well, Brother Dale, that's enough. I just want to get there. Well, I do want to get there, but but I want to get a crown, don't you? So that I can have something to give to Jesus. It's, It's not going to be the greatest thing in the world to be in heaven and not have something to offer the King of kings and Lord of lords. You see, when we get thinking that way, we get selfish thinking, don't we? When we get thinking, I just make it in. That's all I'm worried about. It used to be a song that people would sing, just give me a cabin on the backside of heaven. Well, there's not any of them. They're all mansions according to the Word of God. And if we get there and we get in a mansion, my goodness, can you imagine how that you're going to want to give something to Jesus? If you've earned something, yes, I said earned, and yes, I said works are important. We're not saved by works lest any should boast. This thing of salvation is a free gift. All you got to do is say, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. 
I want to be redeemed. I want to be saved. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to worry about this tribulation period. I want to be born again, and I'll give you my life. I'll live for you. So then when we start living for Him, at that point of conversion, the Lord starts taking notes of everything that we do. And then, after we die, we appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Much different than the great white throne judgment. This is the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema judgment, if you will. That's the judgment seat of Christ where every person will be judged for the works that they have done in this body. Now, if the works were done as unto the Lord, they're going to be, they're going to be good. They're going to withstand the fiery judgment. The Bible says they'll be tried by fire, wood, hay, and stubble. All of those kind of things will burn up, but if they're precious stones, they'll last. I love working with stones. When I'm, when I'm working in my little shop with rocks and I get some, some rocks that look so, so ugly in their raw form and, and I start polishing them and the more I polish and the more I gr- grind and the more I rub and the more I cut and the more I get the shape coming out and it starts gleaming and it starts getting prettier and prettier and I get thinking... You know, who could I give this to? My wife has got so many rocks. I'm telling you what, she probably couldn't carry them in a bushel. By. She's got one on tonight if you want to look at it on the way out. But uh, what, what I'm saying is rocks remind me stones, precious stones, will withdure the flame. If our works are wood, hay, and stubble, when the Lord tries it with the brightness of His presence, they'll be consumed just like that, and they won't stand. So, that's just a little side note. Oh, my goodness, it's 820, and i got another point to go yet. So, after the Lamb and the 144,000 and the messages of the first three angels, John sees the harvest of the earth. The harvest of the earth. That's verses 14 on through the end of the chapter. And I'm going to have to read them quick, or I won't be able to get finished here. But let's read through it quickly. Then I looked, verse 14, and behold, a white cloud... On the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, He also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. He cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God, The wine press was trampled. This is a picture of the Battle of Armageddon, if you want to know where we're heading. If I don't get to that, I hope I do. But this is a picture of the Battle of Armageddon. And the wine press was trampled outside the city. And blood came out of the wine press up to the horses' bridles. For 1,600 furlongs let both grow together until the harvest. Wait a minute. I got ahead of myself. Verse 20. Let, and the wine press was trampled outside the city, and the blood came out of the wine press up to the horses' bridles for 1,600 furlongs. So let's look at that right quick. I'm going to rush through here. John now sees a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like the Son of Man with a golden crown. That's a victor's crown if you look it up in the original. Stephanos is the the original name on his head and a sharp sickle was in his hand. The Lord Jesus has this sickle in his hand so he is ready to to begin judgment on unbelievers. A fourth angel comes out of the temple shouting to him on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap for the hour to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is ripe. In the parable of the weeds... Jesus describes the harvest or the judgment in the end times. And I threw this in here on purpose so that you could kind of correlate what's happening here. Jesus said, 
let both, this is Matthew 13, 30, let Jesus, Jesus said, let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So that's what it was talking about here. Without details, John writes, so he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. As in Jesus' parable of the weeds, this is a picture of believers being taken to heaven and unbelievers being sent to eternal punishment. The details of this judgment are recorded in chapter 16, and we'll get there here uh, in a few weeks. Next, a fifth angel comes out of the temple in heaven and a sharp sickle, meaning he is a reaper. The scene also connects with Jesus' parable of the weeds. Out of the altar comes a sixth angel who has authority over fire. He shouts to the angel with a sharp sickle, Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for it is grapes. Its grapes are ripe. The grapes represent unbelievers who are gathered and thrown into the great wine press of the wrath of God. These grapes are trampled in the wine press outside the city. Now listen to this. This is broken down in today's language. As these grapes are thrown into the wine press just outside the city, the blood flows in a stream as high as a horse's bridle. That is considered to be four feet high. For 1,600 stadia or about 180 miles. Can you imagine a stream of blood four feet high and 180 miles long? That almost makes you tremble as you think about that. This symbolically pictures the Battle of Armageddon, and we're going to see that in chapter 19 when we get there, which will be a slaughter beyond anything the world has ever seen. Because of the horrible destiny of unbelievers, we should never compromise Never dilute or never pollute the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we try to be liked, and so many preachers, so many teachers today are putting more emphasis on being liked than they are on preaching the pure word of God. And I'm saying this out of love. I'm not judging anybody. But I'm saying that there are thousands of people that are thronging into crowds and they are having itchy ears, and they are hearing words that say, do whatever you want to do. In the end, the love of God will cover you, and it will be okay. There's a church, a large church denomination. That church denomination is called the Methodist Church. I'm just going ahead and saying it because everybody knows it anyway. They have split because of these proclamations. And I'm thanking God there's still some good, old-fashioned, if I can use that word tonight, people that believe the Word of God that is not willing to allow folk that are compromising the gospel and putting people up in the pulpit who are of a belief that you can be a man and marry a man or a woman and marry a woman or that you can allow your children to change their genders. My friend, we've gotten so off of this precious book because we say everybody's covered with the blood. There is a side of God, and you've been hearing it here in the book of Revelation, that we're all going to have to answer to. And if we don't have Jesus in our heart, the only other alternative is terrible, terrible picture to look at. This symbolically pictures the Battle of Armageddon because of the horrible destiny of unbelievers, don't ever compromise, dilute or pollute the gospel. However, we should be willing to go to great lengths and give personal sacrifices so we can reach them wherever they are. That's why this church, Rio East, is the only church I can answer for right now. That's why we go as far as we can go. We've been, up until COVID, going uh, six times a year, every year, for many years, uh, preaching the gospel to the ends of the earth and places where most people won't go. If you've been with me, you know what I'm talking about. Pastor Ronnie started this vision in early 2000, 
and I, follow, I followed right in foot, uh, footsteps with it, and I believe that we need to share where the Lord opens the door. And so we're beginning that again. Pastor Dempsey's been going for me and uh, because they had the country shut down because of COVID, but now in December we're starting back again. So please be praying about that. But we should be willing to go. You see the Lamb and the 144,000. You see the message of the first three angels. You see the harvest of the earth. These are the future scenes near the end of the Great Tribulation period that John has allowed us a peek into uh, right here in the, in the uh, chapter 14 of the Word of God of, of Revelation. I hope that you have enjoyed this teaching tonight. I know that when we get talking about blood running for 180 miles, it's not, it's not too encouraging to people. But my encouragement to you is to simply say these are all an encouragement for us to live holy lives as well as motivation for us to win relatives and friends and neighbors and associates to Christ. It encouraged me when I heard our sister back here say that she was able for the first time to witness to her boss. If you will allow yourself and if you will allow the Holy Spirit through you He'll open up doors you never would have imagined. He'll connect you to people that you never would have thought of being connected to. And He'll put you in places that you never imagined to be so that His Word and His Gospel and His message can get out. And once again, and I'm going to leave you with this scripture, it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, that all should come to forgiveness, that all should get into the kingdom, that all should make it to heaven. It's God's will for everybody to get to heaven. Unfortunately, not everybody's going to get there, so God's perfect will is not going to be done. But it is what it is, and that sacrifice is still there. It's 8.30. Would you stand with me? The Lord's helped us once again tonight, and I appreciate Him. He promised us that if we would study this great book of Revelation, that we would be blessed. And then he pronounced another blessing on us, and he said, if you study it and do it, you'll be blessed. So I'm going to be double blessed. I don't know about you, but I like all the blessings I can get. Father, with all of our hearts, we appreciate you tonight. Thank you for Rio East. Thank you for this group that has patiently uh, listened to this teaching and applied to their heart your perfect word. So, Father, as we go out of this place tonight, we don't know what tomorrow will hold. We don't know what future lies just before us. God, we know that you're coming soon and we're looking for you and expecting you. We ask you to help us, please help us, to be watching and ready. Let each of us tell somebody else and let each of us invite somebody for the service next Wednesday and this coming Sunday if we're still here. We love you and appreciate you. And we ask you to go with your kids. Bless them when they come in. Bless them when they go out. We ask it in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. If anybody needs special prayer, I'd love to pray with you. Anything you need to pray about or stand in for, we'd be happy to do that. Otherwise, go with God and He will always go with you.